Hey guys, Ian Harvey here. Today we're going to talk about myofascial release. I know I've mentioned it in a million of my past videos, but I've never quite, but I've never done a video just laying down exactly what it is. So this is just going to be the basics, but we're also going to be exploring the basics a little more in depth. We're going to start with some self-demonstration, at which point I'll talk about some of the anatomy and some of the terms that we'll be discussing. And after that, we'll get a client on the table and I will demonstrate some techniques and also talk a bit more about the philosophy of myofascial release. And if you've never encountered this term before, or if you're curious, you've heard people throwing it around, but you don't know what it means, myofascial release has a lot in common with other styles of massage. It just has a different way of approaching the techniques and there are some different intentions behind it. And it can have some interesting effects that Swedish or that more direct acupressure type massage uh, don't. For the demonstration portion, we're going to do a little bit of work on our lateral base skull regions. So let's start with some clean hands. Uh, and we're going to be engaging the tissue just at the bottom of this mandible right where the masseter inserts. So we're going to scoop up this tissue on both sides. This is about my finger placement. And we're directing our pressure up, up toward the ceiling or up toward the top of the head at about a 30 degree angle. And we're not going to be using a ton of pressure here. Just think three or four pounds of pressure and realize that by being so gentle, this is going to take quite a bit of time. This isn't something that I want you to force your way through. This is something that will be excruciatingly slow and that's exactly what we're going for here. So engage that tissue, direct your pressure upward toward the ceiling and just wait. You might not feel a lot of movement right now, but over the course of the next few minutes, you'll notice that your fingers have moved. So this is the slowest that myofascial release can be. It can be quite a bit quicker, it can be quite a bit more vigorous, but um, I thought that this incredibly slow demonstration might help you feel what the value is in slowing way, way down. As we do this, if any of this is painful at all, use less pressure or introduce just a tiny bit of lubrication. So while we're doing this, while we're waiting, let's talk about fascia. What, what is fascia? Fascia is the thin, connective tissue that covers and weaves through our entire body. Fascia is the reason that we are human shaped. It's the reason that your neck isn't the same diameter as your head, which is great because that would look weird. It's the reason that your biceps are biceps shaped. They're covered in this casing that keeps them in a very specific arrangement. And it's also the reason why you can have a lot of muscles packed into the same space and that they can slide past each other and have independent functions because they're wrapped individually like Tootsie Rolls. And the fascia that surrounds our muscles, the epimesium, paramesium, and endomesium, it's continuous from, when, from one end of the muscle to the other. And those different mesiums, they become the tendon at the end of each muscle. And those tendons don't just get glued on. Wait one second. So we're going to be passing the uh, zygomatic arch here, the cheekbones. And I don't want you to let up those three or four pounds of pressure. Just glide on over those cheekbones as if they're not there. Just conform to that new um, configuration of anatomy under your fingertips. And uh, just make whatever changes you need to to glide past them and then into, the, temp into uh, the temporal region. So the tendons aren't just glued onto bone. Those collagen fibers that make up those different casings, they twine together to form those tendons and, and then those tendons become the periosteum. So it's continuous from muscle to bone. And that's a theme throughout the body. There's no point at which the connective tissue ends. It simply changes form it unweaves itself a little bit and then goes to other parts of the body. So there's a reason why your skin can't be pulled indefinitely off of your muscles. It's because there's a superficial fascia, which is quite loose, and it's what keeps our skin anchored 
to the muscles underneath and to the viscera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So fascia is continuous, and anything that we do that affects the most superficial parts of our body will have effects deep down into the muscle, into the bone, etc. So the fascia is what we're targeting here. We're targeting those sheets of connective tissue. You'll notice that we didn't just target masseter. Instead, we pretty much pretended like it wasn't there. We went far past its origin. And yet, if you open your jaw a little bit, you'll feel that there's still pull happening all the way down to the bottom of your jaw. The same thing as we get up into this thick white fascia of the scalp. We're not necessarily trying to work on any muscles up here in the scalp. We're just continuing with this traction on the fascia so that it will create some pull down into the face. Now what we're not trying to do is change the fascia. The fascia is quite strong. It's made of collagen, which is stronger than steel. So we can't change that without a scalpel, which is outside of our scope of practice. I don't think that we can change the shape or the consistency of the fascia in a lasting way in any one session. What does affect fascia is habit. So over the course of 10 years, if one person is a sloucher and another person has a military posture, they're going to have very different thicknesses and tightnesses in the, ver in the various parts of their fascia. So what we're trying to accomplish here is a conversation with the muscle embedded in that fascia, which is the myo in myofascial release. So we're talking to that muscle and we're talking to the nerve endings embedded in the fascia and the muscle. And by getting those to receive some new stimulus in some new ways, the muscle can reduce its tone and the person who is wearing that body, the person who owns that fascia, will experience it in a new way. And so you can come out of this move right now. And I bet my hair looks funny, and I bet my face looked funny that entire time. That's fine. Uh, feel your face, feel your jaw, move it around a bit. You might feel some freedom, some blood flow, some interesting sensations that you don't get from trigger point work or from Swedish. Instead, there's this very interesting sensation along the sides of my head and I feel like my jaw can hang just a bit instead of having to be so tight and that's what I'm trying to accomplish with myofascial release. I'm trying to give the body the idea that it can have this freedom. So if we're working with someone's posture and we're hoping to get these shoulders to drop back just a bit, I'm not thinking about changing the length or the tone of the fascia itself. I'm thinking of changing the tone of these muscles and of giving the nervous system the idea that this shoulder has always been able to fall back. And when it has that idea, that can make it easier for the client to stand up a bit taller. This is my friend Christina. Hey. With myofascial release, there are three things that we're going to change. We're going to change our angle, we're going to change the speed at which we work, and we're going to change our intent. So let's start with the angle. As I talked about in the intro, um, we're not going to be doing this 90 degree angle. We're not going to be getting directly over the structures that we're working on. Instead, we're going to be working at this 45 degree angle, or we could make it even more extreme with more of a 30 degree angle or something kind of like what we were doing with the jaw massage. So the purpose of this new angle is to engage the fascia. When you take courses on myofascial release, that's a phrase that you'll hear quite often. And to engage the fascia just means to take this covering and give it some traction in some direction. So we're going to take this thoracic fascia and we're going to give it some traction inferiorly. The second thing that needs to change if we're going to be calling our work myofascial release is the speed at which we work. During our self demo, we did some very slow myofascial release indeed. Right now I'm working on Christina's back without any 
a massage medium at all. I don't have any of my jojoba oil on. I don't have any shea butter, no lotion, yada, yada. But because I am being patient and because I am giving this technique some of my weight, I am slowly making progress, especially as she breathes. With every breath, it's changing the shape of the underlying anatomy, and that's changing the shape of the fascia. And I'm able to glide just a bit more as that tissue changes shape. So the word of the day is patience. When you're thinking myofascially, we're thinking of allowing change rather than trying to cause change. And to do that, you need to slow way down. And that brings us to the third thing, which is intent. My intent with myofascial release is to allow that change to happen. And the word that I like to keep in my brain while I'm doing this is melting. If you want something to melt, you don't press harder, you don't um, friction, you don't um, attack it. Instead, you apply your touch and you wait patiently. And you'll find that the tissue changes under your hands. Now, some people who teach myofascial release teach that this phenomenon of melting is something that happens as the fascia itself changes. And I'm not so sure about that. What I do know is changing is that the muscles that are embedded in this fascia, their tone is reducing, so they're becoming more slack. And we're increasing blood supply locally. There's some vasodilation. So the texture of this tissue is going to change. And so by passing very slowly and allowing that change to happen, your client can hopefully experience some of that freedom that we were talking about earlier. Another part of your intention that you can change is to become more curious, to work with these areas that are painful or that could just use some attention and to pay careful attention to the changes that happen under your hands. So feel for that melting, but also feel for the anatomy that's slowly passing by under your hands. Feel for the client's responses, whether it be changes in breathing, whether it be autonomic changes, such as flushing of the skin, which is, of course, vasodilation. And over time, you'll be able to use that new information, not only with that client, but with all of your clients. So let's talk about some frequently asked questions. One that I see often is, what direction should I go? A lot of uh, myofascial release instructors will teach that there's a specific direction that you should traction the fascia in in order to affect certain changes. So if your client has um, hyperkyphosis and they've got rounded shoulders, that teacher might say that you should always send the fascia in this direction. If we sent the fascia in this direction, that would just increase that kyphosis. But that doesn't really jibe with how the body works, with how the nervous system works. If I go in this direction, or if I go in this direction, either way, we're going to be reducing tone, we're going to be giving them that sense of freedom that this myofascial release can provide. But we're not going to be changing this fascia or where it likes to 
stay. We're not going to be permanently moving the fascia in this direction. It's all going to be temporary. But by this temporary change and by this temporary stimulation of the nervous system, we can give the body a, an idea of new ways of moving. So if someone has lordosis, it can definitely be nice to do some spreading in this area and to create some fascial traction in either direction. But I've got nothing against work that goes outward or work that goes toward the spine. I think that all of these are excellent ways of interacting with the fascia, interacting with the nerve endings that invest it, and hopefully allowing your client to get up feeling like, hey, I don't need for my back to be that tight. Another question is how much pressure to use. People will talk about engaging different levels of the fascia and that sinking deeper will have different effects than staying superficial. I don't tend to worry about that too much. Instead, I let my client dictate how much pressure I use. So don't go into this with an agenda. Don't think about changing this fascia. Think about interfacing with this client and their nervous system in a way that's pleasant to them and that will allow this tissue to slowly change. If you try to force that change, the body will fight back. The body does that in any circumstance where you're delivering too much stimulus. But if you meet the body where it's ready to receive pressure at the pace that it's ready to receive it, then you can slowly affect change. And finally, what's the release in myofascial release? You'll hear other practitioners and teachers talk about feeling a muscle release or feeling the fascia release. What I think that they're experiencing is a reduction in tone of the muscles that are embedded in that fascia. I don't think that it's a particularly significant event, but rather it's just something nice to notice. If you notice that release happening, if you notice that tissue letting go, then you're probably doing something right. But if you don't notice that release, that can just be an issue of you not noticing it, or it might not happen for that particular client. Not everyone gets those that melting phenomenon. And yet, despite that, I still find that those clients get excellent results from this work. So I say don't focus too much on release. Don't focus too much on changing the fascia. Don't go in with um, an agenda that I need to change the fascia in this particular way. Instead, just give the relevant structures. Say your client has upper back pain that they associate with their posture. Give all of this some interesting new stimulus and don't worry about pushing the shoulder in a certain way. Just think about doing it in lots of different ways. I find that if I give the body a lot of different kinds of stimulus, it will figure out what to do with that. And finally, some technique demonstration. I've got some jojoba oil on my hands. I don't feel like always going that slowly. In fact, this is going to end up being kind of a myofascial Swedish, which is my normal way of operating. Sometimes I'll dip into that extra slow myofascial, especially when I work with cricks in the neck or with TMJ or with um, a low back that's gone out. But if I'm just working normally, if I'm just giving someone my standard routine, it tends to be very Swedish-ish. So something that doesn't change with myofascial release is the technique. You can still use your palmar surfaces of your hands. You can still use loose open fists. You can still use elbows and forearms. You can still use thumbs. You can still do petrissage. Just have those different intentions in your mind. Still think about melting the fascia. Still think about being curious and listening to what's happening under your hands. And think about 
approaching the body in a lot of interesting different ways. So if I'm dealing with a shoulder that's in pain, I don't want to just work with it in one particular configuration. I want to move the arm and work with the scapula in this new position. I want to deform the tissue under my hands. Any deformation of this tissue is going to, again, yank on the fascia in interesting ways. And anytime I feel like it, I can slow down just a bit and wait for that melting sensation. And even things like petrissage can be given a myofascial feeling. So if I wanted to do a myofascial hold of this trapezius, I would pluck it up. And I'm, so I'm creating some of that fascial traction. And I know this is a weird angle, but I'm trying to keep my arms out of the way here. And now that I've plucked up this fascia and the muscle that's embedded in it, I can just hang out here for a while and wait for that melting to happen. So myofascial release can be static as well. It doesn't always have to be moving. All right, guys, so those are my myofascial basics. Just remember that it's mostly a change in philosophy, but it's also a change in angle and that it's something that can be incorporated into your everyday massage. It's not necessarily a new way of life. Like I said, I tend to do a myofascial Swedish, and that's okay by me. I think it's still quite effective, and uh, it's something that I enjoy a bit more than just that incredibly slow work, though that's a nice tool for your toolbox. Just be curious. Be uh, experimental. Try that extra slow stuff every now and then and talk to your clients. See how they perceive it from their end. You might have some trepidation about going extra slow, but from the client's perspective, it can feel like an incredible amount of movement even if you've only moved an inch. So be curious and experiment. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing. Leave me some comments in the comments section, and I'll see you next time.